You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. Returning to the podcast today is Pierre de Rocher. Pierre, welcome back to Economics Detective Radio. Well, nice to be with you again. Pierre is an associate professor of geography at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. He recently co-authored a paper with Hiroko Shimizu titled Blowing Hot Air on the Wrong Target, a Critique of the Fossil Fuel Divestment Movement in Higher Education. So Pierre, for the people who haven't uh, heard of this movement, who maybe don't spend a lot of time on university campuses, uh, who are they and what are their goals? Well, the fossil fuel divestment movement is really uh, the new rage among uh, environmental activists on university campuses. Uh, It's a movement that is now spread across uh, over a thousand universities uh, in the English-speaking world, a few more in Scandinavia and some other places. I mean, universities that have endowment funds that uh, they invest in various companies to generate returns, which they could use uh, for uh, various, um, you know, building, supporting uh, students uh, through loans and things like that. So the uh, divestment movement uh, is built on the notion that our use of uh, carbon fuels, so, you know, coal, crude oil, uh, natural gas, uh, bitumen, is uh, unsustainable. And as such, uh, universities uh, should take the lead and send a message to uh, carbon produ- carbon fuel producers that uh, their behavior is no longer acceptable. And the way they believe they can reach uh, these companies is not so much through political actions, as many activists did in the past, but by hitting them uh, through their wallet, uh, by having uh, universities sell uh, stocks and other funds that uh, they have invested in the, those corporations. And so really the idea is that students themselves don't have to sell uh, to sell their stocks because the assumption I assume, is that they don't own any. They don't have to give up on using uh, carbon fuels, but they pressure university presidents and university boards so that uh, universities uh, will uh, get rid of their investment in those corporations And I assume invest in other more acceptable form of energies or other products. So this movement, it's it's all about an attempt to manipulate stock prices. Is that correct? Well, that was... well, that was the original assumption. I mean, if you look back at the roots of this movement, it began with uh, student activists at uh, prestigious and very selective uh American college in 2010 who wanted to start a movement against uh, uh, coal uh, mining in uh, West Virginia, so mountaintop removal, if that uh, tells anything to your listeners. But eventually, so these students were uh, uh, inspired by previous uh, movements like, you know, the uh, boycott apartheid, boycott tobacco movement. But eventually, uh, Bill McKibben and uh, the organization uh, he's affiliated with uh, 350.org sort of reframed this movement as a uh, divestment movement that is geared uh, at carbon fuel companies in the fight against uh, global climate change. So again, the uh, inspiration for these things were the uh, were prior divestment movements uh, against uh, South Africa apartheid and uh, tobacco. So I don't know if uh, millennials are familiar with what apartheid was in South Africa, but it was a racist. Uh, it was institutional racism, and so uh, for a while, a number of countries and investors were very active against uh, South African uh, companies, South African investments. And uh, as a Canadian, I should point out, Canada was especially active. Perhaps for humanitarian reasons, but also perhaps because South Africa was a big competitor in terms of various mining products. So, uh, But anyway, so that was the original rational. The original rational was that if universities dump uh, their stocks, well, this will affect uh, the value of these stocks. Prices will go down, companies will notice, and they will begin uh, to change their behavior. But it quickly became obvious, even to activists, that... um, 
in the global world of investment, university endowments are really small potatoes. And only a tiny, tiny fraction of these small potatoes are actually directly invested uh, in energy stocks. And so once they realized that, the activists began to change their rhetoric and argued instead that uh, divestment was a tool of moral shaming. You know, we will no longer uh, tolerate this uh, fossil fuel addiction and universities will take the lead in uh, dumping these stocks, even though they might not affect uh, the bottom line or even the stock value of these companies very much because other investors might simply then, you know, pe people who don't have, let's say, the green conscience of universities might pick up these stocks at a discount and do very well with them. And then more recently, because of uh, low energy prices, uh, activists have, uh, if not exactly changed their rhetoric, at least added the additional argument that uh, in light of uh, low oil prices, uh, universities might as well uh, ditch uh, car uh, carbon fuel stocks anyway because they, uh, they do not seem to be a promising uh, long-term investment. But in that uh, latter case, this is really an economic argument. And my sense is that the movement is still uh, very much about um, uh, taking a moral stance against carbon fuel. So the tool of moral shaming, the virtue signaling, if you will, is really what the movement is about, in my opinion. So there's, uh, I, I noticed sort of a pattern in their thinking, and there's this distinction between the way a scientist is supposed to think about the world, where um, both the arguments and the positions can change when, you know, you find new information, when new things come up, versus the way a lawyer is supposed to argue, where, you know, you have a client and you're supposed to argue a certain position. Yeah, you, you already know the conclusion and you mass, you marshal all the evidence you can to support it. Yeah. As opposed to going where the evidence is supposed to lead you. Right. And you get new evidence and that leads you to change your argument but never your position. So they uh I I think it's very natural for us as humans to to behave in that way to keep our positions fixed and just try to ex post justify them. But you know it's it's epistemically it's a very bad way to to approach the world because this it's not a good way to find the truth yeah that's the thing you know they already have their uh, guilty verdict and so fossil fuels are bad and we must do something about them but what's interesting about this movement is that the problem with invoking let's say the legacy or the precedents uh, set by anti-apartheid and anti-tobacco activists is that uh no people who wanted to divest uh, from these companies actually consumed the products. So, uh, you know, anti-apartheid anti activists never bought, let's say, oranges uh, from South Africa. And anti-tobacco activists obviously were non-smokers, or if there was a smoker in there, uh, I've never met him or heard of him. But the problem with those activists is that uh, they say, well, you know, fossil fuels are an addiction, they're frying the planet, we won't have a future if we uh, don't uh, give up on them. And yet, <clears throat> you look at uh, their daily behavior, you look at them when they go campaign against fossil fuels, and what do you see? Well, you see banners that are made of petroleum products, uh, you see jackets, you see uh, bicycle tires, you see smartphones, uh, you see all sorts of things that are made out of petroleum products. And so, in that particular case... Uh, you don't see uh, any incentive or any discussion uh, of simply boycotting these products, which would seem an even more radical uh, proposition. But, you know, if the future of the planet is at stake, and if, as they say uh, themselves, well, there are, really, there are readily available alternatives, well, why don't you just boycott them in the first place? And so uh, when I've dared uh, to uh, raise the issue, I've been accused of, you know, uh, making ad hominem arguments. But, um, Again, I mean, if uh, these products are so bad, if uh, they're an addiction as opposed to, say, something that you need to survive, like uh, bread, water, or let's say even a computer or paper, uh, if fossil fuels really are an addiction and there are uh, real alternatives available, why don't you boycott them in the first place? And uh, so I think what is original in the paper uh, that I've published is that 
I go beyond the standard uh, economic arguments made against uh, this movement and explain why fossil fuel and synthetic products were developed in the first place and uh, their health, uh, social and environmental benefits. Yeah, there's there seems to be a lot of question begging. You know, a lot of people, even critics, will just accept that, yes, fossil fuels are bad, you know, but this isn't the way to stop them. Yeah, because even uh, you've had a number of activists and other and uh, a number of academics and other environmental activists who also uh, start with the premise that you know fossil fuels are bad, but the way to deal with them is not through uh, an ineffective and moralizing campaign like this, but uh, rather to go through you know green taxes, cap and trade. And interestingly enough, a number of quote unquote green academics have pointed out that. Uh, this is uh, the, the the divestment campaign is a really an effective tool compared to what they would rather see, which are again uh, green taxes and uh, cap and trade policies. So uh, this has to be. I mean, there have been uh, two main currents of opposition to this movement. On the one hand, you have these people who are who have impeccable green credential to say that the movement is ineffective for the reasons that I've mentioned, and other. Uh, People who simply say, well, no, this will have no effect. Uh, divesting from stocks will have no effect on uh, companies, their bottom lines, and uh, the production of carbon fuels and synthetic products as long as there is a demand for them. So, again, if you want to divest from a company, you sell. If universities are mandated by their board or their presidents, themselves acting under pressure from students uh, to divest from uh, their uh, energy stocks, well, uh, other investors will simply pick them up on the belief that, you know, reality is not optional, people need energy, people need carbon fuel, and will do very well uh, for themselves uh, financially. And uh, universities who divest from energy stocks that have also uh, proven uh, you know, a good investment in the last few decades, even though it's a cyclical business and we're actually, uh, we're arguably at the bottom of a particular cycle at the moment, uh, that university that have a less diversified portfolio will, uh, you know, incur higher risks, uh, potentially lower returns, and uh, potential loss of access to best managers who, you know, won't want to be, uh, won't want to have their investment policies dictated by student activists on campus because, you know, if you're told uh, one day to, well, okay, divest carbon fuel stock, what's next? You know, among un unpopular things on campuses like, I don't know, agribusiness, uh, GMOs, pharmaceutical companies, uh, what's next? And this is why, uh, I mean, these are, these are some of the reasons why the campaign has been uh, rather ineffective, even though it has uh, mobilized a lot of energies on campus. I mean, even in a country like Canada, where environmental values are very strong, uh, no major universities has been willing uh, to go down that road. And you often see university presidents uh, contorting themselves, you know, to argue, well, uh, not all carbon fuel companies are bad, and uh, as long as universities use uh, carbon fuels, you know, what right do we have to get out of this, and this, uh, our actions will have no impact. So, uh, activists have been uh, learning some economics, I believe, through their actions, which in the end might be the best thing that they get out of this. I am reminded of a famous experiment by Bert Kammerer conducted in the 1980s, where he placed some large bets at a, a horse racing track and then retracted them at the very last minute. And he found maybe disappointingly that he wasn't able to uh, alter prices even a little bit, even making some very substantial bets because of course, you know, the underlying reality was that certain horses were faster or, you know, had a higher probability of winning and other people were willing to step in and, arbitrage away that difference and so yeah that uh, that's sort of the the problem these divestment activists face yeah, the problem is that reality is not optional yes until something uh, better comes along most people will want uh, 
most people will not want to be cold in the winter or give up on uh, you know food that is imported from further away or buy synthetic products or things that are made out of synthetic products because they're better and cheaper uh, than other alternatives that would be available uh, indeed so and uh, that's part of uh, i believe what is sad a little bit in this movement, or at least in my opinion, and I speak here as someone who has taught energy policy for over a decade, is the fact that these activists take carbon fuels and synthetic products, uh, these activists take these benefits for granted and don't understand why they were uh, developed uh, in the first place. So the rhetoric is always... Well, uh, we have those uh, computer-generated climate models or scenarios that tell us that you know we will free and we will fry a century down the road if we don't leave those uh, carbon fuels in the ground, and yet, and so you know we will have it will be Armageddon, an apocalypse, or what have you, and yet it somehow never occurs to them that before carbon fuels and synthetic products came along, uh, let's say two centuries ago. You had about a billion people on the planet. Today, we're over 7 billion. And the billion people two centuries ago were poor, miserable, and the life expectancy of maybe 30 years of age on average. And the fact now that there are over 7 billion of us that we're wealthy and that, frankly, most of these activists are alive can be traced back in large part, not entirely because, of course, good institution, entrepreneurship and other things matter too. But the fact that most of these activists are alive in the first place can be traced to a very large extent to our use, to humanity's use of carbon fuel and synthetic products. And so it's one thing to uh, worry about climate change scenarios. And again, I'm not... I'm an economic and historical geographer by training. I don't pretend to be a climate scientist. But it's one thing to worry about hypothetical uh, scenarios in that respect. But they completely negate or perhaps are rather oblivious to the fact that the, most of them wouldn't be alive in the first place if it hadn't been for uh, the development of carbon fuels and, and synthetic products. So, you know, humanity going cold turkey off of them would have consequences that, in my opinion, are way would be way more damaging than you know some warming that rich people could probably adapt to. I, a critic might say that, well, you know, we don't need fossil fuels because you know, look at the advances in solar power, or or look look at wind power. You know, the wind is free, right? It 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 comes whether we collect it or not. Yeah, the wind is free, the sun is free, there are tides, there are molten rocks, we could tap into geothermal energy. But again, what's missing from uh, this discussion, and this is where I believe that my paper plays, if I dare say so, a somewhat especially useful role, is to trace the history of these developments uh, in the 19th century, because it will come as no surprise to your listeners that uh, before carbon fuels came along, every little stream that could be dammed and could be uh, used to generate some power was actually dammed. So we have accounts, you know, from France, England, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of little mills all over uh, the landscape. Um, and of course, again, uh, you had the tide, you had the sun, you had geothermal. But the reason why uh, coal at first became prominent is that coal uh, gave you a lot more power. Um, you could uh, build a plant uh, wherever you could get coal delivered to a particular location, which was typically, you know, in large cities or in ports where perhaps water power uh, was uh, was not an option. And so it allowed humanity to create a lot more torque or to generate a lot more energy, if I may speak in uh, layman terms. Um, and it was the development of coal that was essentially the food of machine that allowed people to have more machines in the first place. And so, for example, uh, in the paper, I discuss um, a number of 19th century writers who compare uh, water power as it was used then to coal. And they say, well, the advantages of coal are just so overwhelming and we can generate so much more power that way. And then uh, you you read about uh, windmills at the time, because, of course, people use windmills uh, when water power was not available. And so, again, you had thousands of windmills uh, all over Europe. But the problem is that windmills and solar power, for that extent, have a number of problems. 
Uh, first of all, they don't work uh, most of the time. You know, there is such a thing as night. So if you want to build a society on solar power, you can have a problem there. But uh, the wind doesn't blow uh, very often. And uh, when it does, it's perhaps uh, not strong enough or perhaps even too strong. So you need uh, wind <clears throat> to be in a particular range to be useful. Um, so it's what is called in the jargon intermittent. It's more costly. And on top of that, what is also missing from a large uh, portion of that discussion is that uh, our transportation system does not run on electricity, but it runs uh, still mostly on petroleum product, you know, uh, diesel, gasoline, uh, bunker fuel uh, for container ships. And there are simply no alternatives to petroleum products in terms of transportation, uh, in terms of uh, synthetic products. So if I look around my office, I have uh, book covers that are made out of that. I have uh, filing cabinets, I have clothing, I have all sorts of other things. Um, there's nothing that alternative energy can do with that. And let's face it, if it had not been for uh, government mandates, uh, you know, feed-in tariffs or uh, mandating the purchase of uh, one form of electricity over another, there would be no renewable uh, energy sector uh, to speak of at the moment. So, uh, again, something that I discuss in, uh, to some extent in the paper is how uh, really, as far as electricity production is concerned, and obviously in other sectors where electricity is not so significant, or at least not to the same extent, uh, like transportation and synthetic products, there are no real alternatives uh, to carbon fuel. And if we try to get rid of them, we're just being thrown back to that kind of poverty uh, that you had in the past. Another uh, point I try to make is that the real environmental benefits of carbon fuels is that Humanity has slowly but surely been substituting stuff that was produced on the surface of the earth. Uh, let's say uh, wood, some crops that, that were used, you know, like cotton or uh, linseed or stuff like that to make clothes, uh, to make belts, uh, to make uh, textiles of various kinds, uh, things that uh, were uh, used for uh, non-food uses, like, I don't know, hunting whales for oil, for example. Uh, all these resources that used to be um, harvested from the surface of the earth, a large number of them, have been replaced by stuff that uh, we now extract from underground. And the result is that uh, the earth is now greener and cleaner than it was in the past, even though there are much, uh, many more of us around and we consume and produce a lot more stuff than before. And that's, again, because humanity has been able to tap into stuff that was underground and substitute that stuff for uh, good fashion economic reasons to things that used to be produced on top uh, of the surface. I, one thing that really interested me in your paper was uh, the issue of reforestation. I I still hear things about deforestation, and so I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that in many places forests are actually advancing rather than receding. So could could you talk about that a little? Yeah, in all advanced economies and in all economies where poor people have access to, you know, propane, kerosene, natural gas, what have you, the landscape has been reforesting. And there are a number of reasons for that. So what happened until the advent of fossil fuels in the 19th century is that the world or people were still living mostly what would be what we would call today the locavores dream you know so they were producing things uh, mostly for themselves and uh, growing uh, stuff uh, for themselves and that's because transportation was really bad uh, in the past so before, for example, asphalt came along, uh, road transportation was a disaster. So uh, I don't know if uh, any of your listeners have ever experienced the joy of uh, driving, you know, on a muddy road in the middle of nowhere, but uh, try to imagine how costly uh, land uh, transportation was. And actually, the statistic I usually use is that, you know, in the 18th century, Moving goods between uh, Manchester and Liverpool in England, which would be what forty, fifty kilometers, uh, moving uh, you know heavy goods over land was as expensive as putting them on the boat from Liverpool and uh, shipping that stuff to New York on a sailing boat. So that's how uh, expensive uh, land transportation was. And then, of course, uh, boats were always uh, 
much cheaper in terms of transport. But before coal came along, you know, what you had were uh, sailboats that were made out of wood. And in those uh, boats, you could only go where the uh, wind patterns and the ocean currents made it profitable to do so. So the size of the boats were li- was limited because a wooden boat can only be so big. And then you were really at the mercy of what nature has created, you know, that created you know, wind patterns, ocean currents, and uh, what have you. But in the 19th century, what happens is that coal really takes off, the Industrial Revolution comes along, steel become cheaper, and so boats uh, on water and railroad on land really usher in a transportation revolution. And now, for example, you can go upstream on a river economically, uh, you can... um, you can take a ship anywhere in the world without factoring in ocean patterns and uh, uh, ocean currents and wind patterns anymore. And so the cost of transporting, uh, transporting goods really uh, goes down. And of course, in the 20th century, we saw the container revolution, which drove the cost of moving goods around uh, a lot more. And so what happens is that you can see in the beginning of the 19th century, people moving out of subsistence farming, increasingly growing the best type of food for a particular location in the best locations. And so a lot more food over time is uh, produced using a lot less land. And then, you know, other technologies that are derived from uh, fossil fuels came along, you know, tractors, replaced horses, for example, horses and mule. Horses and mules, you know, they would get sick. They wouldn't work all the time. They would eat about 20% of the food that they produce. So you substitute, you concentrate food production in the best locations. Uh, you can move a large, a large quantities of food over long distances affordably. Uh, you introduce new technologies to produce food, again, replacing uh, work animals, but producing, for example, uh, pesticides and fertilizers uh, using carbon fuels. And so the price of food goes down because the yields of food in the world's best location go up. And so we've reached a point in history where we can produce a lot more food on a lot less land, and people typically eat uh, food that is produced from outside of uh, their local area. And so what happens the world over is that uh, people give up on farming in uh, you know uh, rugged terrain like for example in north america you had a lot of subsistence farming in appalachia so people would cut down a lot of tree practice slash and burn farming but eventually people left the farm in the worst places and in areas like you know uh, new england appalachia but also in parts of the south the west and even the mountain west a lot of agricultural land was abandoned because people would rather live in cities that were made possible by that transportation revolution and they could no longer compete economically with uh, the world's best location. And so what we've seen in the last uh, two centuries, really beginning in Western Europe or in uh, places like uh, New England and the United States, is the abandonment of subsistence farming and nature either spontaneously uh, being uh, reforested or in uh, some places where the farmland was not all that productive but not all that bad either, the creation of three plantations. And so the world over, uh, except really around the equatorial belt where you find the poorest economies in the world, uh, the forest cover has made a comeback. Uh, Even though, again, we went from a world population that was maybe a billion people in 1800 to over uh, 7 billion today, there there are many more people on the earth today. They're a lot richer than in the past. But again, we don't need... We don't practice subsistence farming anymore on a large scale outside of the poorest economies. And as a result, a lot of marginal agricultural land the world over uh, has been reforested. Now, take off uh, carbon fuels from this equation, take off uh, synthetic products. You know, people used to grow a lot of stuff for uh, reasons other than eating them. Like, for example, uh, a lot of plants were grown to produce dyes at one point in time. So, you know, indigo, some of your listeners might be familiar with that. You know, genes are blue because uh, the indigo plant gave you that blue that you would use. There was something called matter that used to produce red, brown, oranges, what have you. But uh, carbon-based uh, uh, products and then petroleum products came along. Re- uh, humanity replaced synthetic dyes, replaced natural dyes by synthetic dyes. And suddenly you don't need that land anymore to produce uh, things like that. And so, again, <laughs> by using resources that came from underground instead of resources that were produced on the surface, humanity became more numerous, richer, and at the same time, 
uh, was able to reforest the planet. So there is this very counterintuitive notion that you can have your economic cake and your environmental cake too, but you need a heavy dose of uh, carbon fuels and synthetic products to achieve that result. To any listeners who are maybe not aware of Pierre's work in this area, he wrote a book called The Locavore's Dilemma that's all about the global food market. So I, I'll link to that on the show notes page, economicsdetective.com slash divestment. I just thought I'd throw the plug in there since uh, you're too modest to uh, to do it yourself. <laughs> well, thank you very, thank you very much. <laughs> so yeah, I... Um, yeah, I, I have actually seen your presentation on that book, and uh, I'm you know, struck by the the suburbs outside Paris, and they had uh, these glass domes where yes. they would grow um, asparagus out of season, and it was just this very costly process. Or even pineapples in some cases, and that's the thing, and that's what happened because you know there is all this, and we call it nostalgia about. Mm. Uh, Local food today, we don't know where our food is produced. Well, the reason why that happened is because, again, transportation, the steamship and uh, the railroad at first in the 19th century and the, more recently, you know, uh, refrigeration, container shipping and all those other things have made it possible to concentrate food production in the world's uh, best location. So when nature gives you the heat free of charge, uh, when you're in a drier climate where you don't have as much of a, let's say, a pest or a fungus problem than in other locations, then obviously it makes sense to use a comparative advantage, which is something that is, again, uh, completely lost on local food activists. But if I may just get back to carbon fuels and food, another thing that is completely missed by local food activists is that it was carbon fuels that ultimately defeated famine. And uh, the problem historically was that people who relied on local, you know, let's call them organic uh, resources or their local environment, would periodically starve because no matter where you live, uh, you will have bad years, you know, too much heat, uh, not enough rain, uh, insect pests or what have you. And it was only carbon fuels that made possible the movement of large quantities of food over long distances. And so spontaneously, unless politicians got involved, Humanity developed this sort of food insurance policy, which is that, you know, the more integrated our world food system becomes, the less famine you have because regions that have bad years can always rely on the surplus of regions that have good years and vice versa. And so uh, get rid of carbon fuels, uh, make transportation much more expensive, which is the dream of a lot of anti-fossil fuel activists. And I'm sorry, but food security will be one of the first casualty. I mean, again, it's people take fossil fuels for granted and you think fossil fuels, you think maybe driving your car or if you're a bit more knowledgeable, you might think, oh, my clothes or whatever. But, you know, I could have cotton clothes as opposed to synthetic products. But moving large quantities of food over long distances and making food as abundant as it is today and, you know, having completely erased the memory of famine is something that cannot be achieved without carbon fuels. There are simply no alternatives to carbon fuels in uh, transportation. And so, again, people who think of uh, carbon fuels, of petroleum products as an unmitigated bad should remember what life was like without uh, our sophisticated uh, transportation system. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why people were so, uh, there's a reason why a lot of people, a lot of very smart people work very long and very hard uh, to develop, again, trains, steamships, containers, and things like that. Uh, these were real problems that were addressed, and the most sensible, the most economical way to do it was by uh, using uh, a lot of uh, carbon and uh, a lot of carbon fuels and synthetic products. So, but again, this is uh, one of those things that, and uh, that uh, fossil fuel divestment activists and local food activists were often the same people <laughs> simply don't understand. You, you say there's no alternatives. Uh, why, why can't we just put, say, a, a huge battery on, um, on one of these tanker ships and just you know, plug it in at one end and then send it across the ocean? Well, uh, I don't want to get into issues like energy density and how much energy can be stored in a battery. But, you know, there's a reason why uh, you have batteries uh, in your computer, uh, but uh, you don't have, well, I mean, 
Okay, you've got cars like Teslas, for example, which, in my opinion, are you know uh, toys for rich people. They're not something that can be mass produced, and uh, you know you don't have much storage space in there. It's more a toy for show. But uh, again, the reason why uh, things like the diesel engine and the use of diesel were developed in the first place is that you can store a lot of energy and generate the torque that you need very conveniently uh, in a uh, in a boat or think of it this way you know the electric car that would be the subject of another podcast if you ever want to do uh, one on those topics but you know what is so great about a conventional car as opposed to an electric car well among other things you know you can uh, put gasoline or diesel in your car in a matter of minutes if you want to charge your car batteries you need to plug it for something like six or eight hours And then how much mileage will you get out of your battery versus how much mileage will you get out of uh, your internal combustion engine? What will happen when you turn on the AC? What if you add extra weight in your car, in an electric car? Uh, what God for, what if God forbids, you know, you run into a wall or something and, you know, your electric car is uh, too dangerous to open by rescuers because it's still live and you have all these wires uh, going around. Again, I don't want to get too technical, but in a market economy, products are developed through trial and errors, and those that get selected over time, by cons- ultimately by consumers, are those that create uh, lesser problems than products that existed before. And so, again, the reason why planes don't run on electricity or why, you know, well, I mean, you, you have trains that run on electricity that are typically, you know, in urban environments, then you can hook them on the grid. It's more expensive, but they don't pollute, they don't smell as bad. And uh, this is something that you can do in a city. But, for example, if you ever take Amtrak in the United States and you decide, okay, I'll take the train from Boston to Florida. Well, what happens? From what I understand, from Boston to Washington, uh, the train mostly operates on electricity because you can connect it on the grid. But as soon as you uh, enter DC, they will change the engine on your train and uh, they will replace it with a diesel engine. And the reason why they do that is that moving electricity over long distances, especially in a low populated area, is extremely expensive and inconvenient. Which is why, again, uh, you know, something like a delivery truck or uh, a container ship cannot run on electricity. Anyway, I don't want to get too technical here, but uh, trust me, if if these things, if transportation could be run on electricity, you would see a lot more of it. The fact that the only electric cars that you see on the road are cars that are either uh, toys for rich people or cars that are mostly used, uh, you know, as a form of virtue signalism by environmental activists should tell you something. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm just uh, laughing a bit here. Uh, my parents recently bought a Nissan Leaf. Oh, how did that go? <laughs> I, well, they went had, when they went on. I mean, they do like it. It is kind of a fun toy. But you know, they went on a road trip to go um, surfing, and you know, what would be a six hour drive, you know, you had to have these long stops at every charging station just to, to make uh-huh. it there. Right. Um, when I visit my fiance's parents, it's a, it's a seven, eight hour trip in my car, which takes get regular gasoline. But if I had a, if I had to stop and charge four or five times along the way, um, you know, I'd, I'd never make it there by the, by the time, the the weekend or or something you know the visit would be over before it started and again it's just an illustration that maybe uh, more people can relate to than other examples i could use of you know why uh, carbon fuels are so dominant in the transportation sector again it's not the problem, what honestly really oripilates me with activists, if I can use that word, is that they assume that you know we're forced to use carbon fuels, and it was big oil that forced them down our throat. No, they 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 passed the market test. You know, they proved better than the alternatives, and this is why we use them. And I'm sure that something better. I mean, I hope something better comes along one day. But then you will not need any divestment campaign to get rid of carbon fuels. You know, they will be discarded because uh, something better uh, will have been created. In the meantime, if you make the argument that, uh, yeah, there are real, uh, there are better alternatives out there and it's only big oil that has forced it upon us. Well, why didn't Stalin, or for that matter, I don't know, the 
the North Korean government today, you know, people who are not in t- were not or are not in theories uh, subjected to the whim of big oil company. Why don't they use them if those alternatives exist? And the short answer is that they don't. So yes, carbon fuels are not perfect, but again, if you assume if you're willing to grant the notion that reality is not optional, they're the products that have survived the market test and they're better than the other alternatives. And if they were not, well, you know, government would not need to uh, keep Tesla artificially alive or uh, companies like Nissan, for example, would not need to be mandated to produce a certain number of electric cars. They would do them uh, just for, uh, you know, e- economic reasons. I, I feel there's sort of a, a conflict here between potentially the same uh, people, but maybe different groups of activists. After Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, there was a big movement to get away from nuclear power and countries like <laughs> Germany, which used to produce a whole lot of nuclear power, ended up shutting down their nuclear plants and replacing them with... Well, essentially, well, you know, they pretend it's uh, wind and, uh, you know, solar. And uh, so uh, you go to Germany, you see all those solar panels there. But, you know, uh, most parts of Germany, from what I understand, get about as much sunshine. I mean, you're in Vancouver, right? It's about yes. the same as Vancouver or Seattle, which, you know, might strike you as uh, being weird. So... Uh, they've built and they've lost a ton of money on uh, building wind turbine and solar panel. But what really Germany has done is because, again, reality is not optional. They're burning a lot of low-quality coal to keep their system going. But uh, the problem is that, again, you know, solar panels and uh, wind uh, turbines are expensive. They're intermittent. You cannot run a modern economy on them. So you need uh, what is called base load, or at least you need something that really generates a large amount of power uh, when you need it. And so what has happened is that uh, when these mandates have been uh, put forward, you've had either Germany reverting to uh, low-quality coal, or in the United Kingdom, what they did instead was to import a lot of wood chips from Russia, the United States, and apparently Brazil will begin to send them a lot of wood chip. And that's, you know, because wood in a way is an inconvenient substitute to coal or natural gas, but at least the supply is reliable and you know that you'll be able to produce uh, energy, uh, to produce electricity when you need it. But again, this is like going backward. What is viewed as sustainable is really going back to an era where people used to consume resources from the surface of the earth rather than from underneath the earth. And of course, the problem is that electricity becomes a lot more expensive. I mean, uh, prices have gone through the roof in uh, much of Western Europe, you know, when uh, quote unquote sustainability initiatives or green energy uh, policies are put forward. The first victims are poor people uh, who have to spend a lot more money eating their house. And I remember reading a story a few months ago in uh, West Germany where people said, well, uh, used book sales are going up. It's not that people are reading them more. It's that uh, burning, uh, you know, uh, books in your little stove at home is cheaper than buying electricity uh, from uh, whoever is supplying it to you because of those green policies. And so, again, there is a reason why carbon fuels were uh, developed in the first place. And it's one thing for wealthy activists who, if they're not already in the world top 1%, uh, will certainly be one day to say to poor people, uh, you know, uh, give up on fossil fuels, which is essentially telling them, well, there's no bread, so eat cake instead. So, again, uh, I have a profound problem with that, and I wish that those activists would take a little more time to educate them uh, to educate themselves on energy history. But that's me. That's what I do as an educator. So, so to clarify the the coal issue in Germany, the dirty coal or the wood chips in Britain, when you have an electrical grid, it's not enough to just produce, you know, if you if you need a million... Yeah, you need to produce the electricity when it is demanded by consumers. There's no big band, there's no giant battery anywhere. So uh, what happens, for example, when uh, you produce a lot of electricity with wind turbines? So, okay, th- there are a number of issues to disentangle here. So you you hear sometimes that, you know, a country like Denmark is producing 140% of its electricity supply through wind or, you know, at one point uh, in Germany during one hour, one particular holiday weekend in the summer, all their electricity was renewable. 
but the, the the problems are complex. So in Denmark, for example, what happens if you've ever been there? It's uh, very flat, very windy, and there I see very gray and very boring. Anyway, I drove through the <laughs> Danish countryside, and uh, yeah, it seems kind of gray and windy. And so they've built all these wind turbines. But what happens when uh, the wind comes along? Well, of course, you ramp up production, and your grid would essentially if I may use the image, would, would burn or would explode if you were not dumping your electricity elsewhere. And so what happens in a small country like Denmark, and this is the same thing that we've seen here in Ontario, is that when all the wind turbines come online, they produce way too much electricity for what they need. And so they sell it to a discount to places like Germany, Sweden, or Norway. But when the wind comes down, the great luck of Denmark is that it is connected to uh, the Norwegian and Swedish grids, which have a lot of hydropower, which is extremely flexible. And, you know, they can buy the, uh, they can uh, ramp up electricity production by bringing more uh, water turbines online and then selling that electricity to Denmark. And so what happens in the, in the, in the context of Denmark or, or Ontario is that when the wind comes up, they produce a lot of electricity, but they have no choice but to dump it at very discounted price to neighboring uh, grids, neighboring uh, jurisdictions. And the same is true here in Ontario. But the problem is that activists or journalists who don't understand what is going on will see the total amount of wind produced by wind turbines. They will look at the amount of electricity that is consuming, let's say, in a jurisdiction like Ontario and Denmark, and they will say, well, look, it's wonderful. You know, we can produce most of our electricity using renewables, which is not the case at all, because most of that electricity, when it is produced, which is at nature's whim, needs to be dumped at a discount and often... uh, Ontario loses money to uh, the electricity needs to be dumped in uh, places like uh, Michigan and upstate New York. But because we need to produce electricity when consumers uh, need it, we need to keep coal fire plants online in some jurisdiction or in others, it might be nuclear or it might be something else. But electricity uh, produced through renewable means is unreliable and it is also very expensive. And so when you read that, for example, uh, one hot summer uh, in Germany when all the electricities were offline uh, because there was a holiday, 100% of the supply was produced through renewable means. Well, it's because people have no choice there because of the law to buy electricity from renewable means, even though it might be a lot more. It, it is a lot more expensive than, you know, if you were to buy it from utilities that would use coal or natural gas. Anyway, it's kind of complex, but the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a reason why modern economies were built on cheap, reliable, and plentiful energy supplied by mostly coal, natural gas, and uh, petroleum products. And trying to uh, quit them in the absence of uh, real-world alternatives that are economical, dependable, scalable, is just going to create a lot of problems, and the first victims will be uh, people of lesser means. So uh, for these activists who are concerned about the environment, but maybe don't quite understand that the issues we've talked about, I mean, hopefully they're listening and they they learn an important lesson, but... uh, if you could give some advice to them, uh, you know what what would you tell them? What should they be doing instead? Well, I would tell them, listen, I know your heart is in the right place, but you've been misinformed. There are many things that are screwed up in our energy system, but in the short run, carbon fuel should not be your real priorities. Uh, your real priority, something like ethanol policy, for example, should be uh, something that you devote a lot more effort to. I mean, what do we do with ethanol? We're essentially putting human food into cars, which is, again, profoundly immoral, but because, you know, corn or whatever else they might use, let's say sugar cane in Brazil is, you know, is grown and is therefore renewable. Renewable does not mean more sustainable, and it certainly doesn't mean more ethical. So uh, please consider that. And then uh, if your goal is to tell other people how to live their lives, well, why don't you... uh, Give, uh, give yourself as an example. Why don't you make a real sacrifice to at least convince us to take you seriously? So limit your cell phone usage or your internet usage to one hour a day. You know, use a drying cloth 
uh, give up on your vacation, uh, reduce the size of your wardrobe by two thirds. You know, in the grander scheme of things, these actions will not be meaningful at all, but at least it would convince us that activists are willing to make sacrifices. So when you're essentially telling people in less advanced economies to give up on the kind of cheap energy provided by coal, for example, uh, what you're basically telling them is to uh, remain in poverty and not develop their economies. Well, the least you can do, in my opinion, would at least be uh, willing to show them that you're willing to make a sacrifice. And whatever energy we don't use in advanced economies as a result of your actions could sort of, quote unquote, be allocated to poor people so that they could grow their economy. But uh, what I would also tell them is that, you know, there are plenty of other problems in the world, you know, uh, malnutrition, illiteracy that activists could make a useful uh, contribution to. And I understand the appeal of, you know, wanting to save the planet as opposed to, let's say, finance a a polio vaccination campaign in some country or uh, deal with, uh, you know, malaria or something through effective means. But again, the road to hell is, is paved with good intentions and a policy should be judged by its results, not by its intentions. And if you try to take a broader perspective on the fossil fuel divestment cause or a movement, uh, it's hard to believe that it's really uh, the best uh, use you can make of your time if you want to make the world a better place. My guest today has been Pierre de Rocher. Pierre, thanks for returning to Economics Detective Radio. Happy to have done so anytime. As I mentioned earlier, the show notes for this episode will be at economicsdetective.com slash divestment. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or, or Stitcher or whatever podcast app you use. That way you'll always get the newest episode. The other thing you can do is if you go to economicsdetective.com, you may notice a, a little pop-up that I added. I apologize for adding a pop-up, but you know, hopefully it's not too irritating where you can put in your email and you can get on my email list. And then, of course, I'll email you when there's new content. I do release content in a lot of ways, so blog posts, podcast episodes, YouTube videos. And um, I'd really like to have an email list and you for you to be on it because I would like more ways to connect with my audience. A lot of people just hit subscribe, and that's great. But I have no real way to, to reach you if I need to tell you something beyond the scope of the podcast so that would be great sign up for my email list you can go over to economicsdetective.com and do that thank you very much